You're listening to Drug Positive, the risk reduction and benefit enhancement podcast, reducing shame and stigma to save lives and end the drug war. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all safe out there, not too depressed by the events going on in the world. If uh, you're like me, maybe you've been drinking more, using alcohol to cope with the pandemic, social isolation, financial trouble, right-wing lunatics refusing to wear masks. The world today is fucking depressing. It is. And drugs are a great way to cope. They really are, especially alcohol. But how do you know if you're drinking too much? How much is too much? And how do you know whether or not you've become addicted to alcohol or whatever drug you might be using? Well, that's the topic of today's show. In this episode, I interview Maya Salovitz, who wrote an amazing book on addiction. It's called The Unbroken Brain. I've talked about it here before, and I can't recommend it enough. If you like nonfiction, if you like learning, and you want to understand addiction, go buy Maya's book right now. You won't regret it. The Unbroken Brain. And I'm so excited I got the chance to interview her and for you to hear it. You know, she also interviewed me the day before I interviewed her because she's writing a book on the history of harm reduction. And so I can't wait for that book to come out too. Anyway, this is the first episode I've ever done on the topic of addiction. I tend to stay away from it really because when it comes to recreational drug topics, Addiction already dominates most discussions. It gets an unfair share of the pie in terms of number of books, online articles, etc. As you've heard me say before, most people who use drugs, even regularly, aren't addicted. Yet addiction is the first thing that comes to mind for most people when you bring up the topic of recreational drug use. And so I wanted drug positive to be the voice for the majority of drug users and help break the association between drugs and addiction. Because psychoactive drugs are amazingly positive and beneficial most of the time. But still, they can be dangerous, and nobody can deny that problematic drug use exists. Addiction can be devastating, actually, for those who suffer from it and for their loved ones. Before we get into it, though, let's talk terminology for a minute. Some people in the harm reduction movement don't like to use the term addiction. They prefer simply problematic drug use. But others say let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. While derogatory labels like addict are pretty much universally understood today not to be helpful, there still is a set of behaviors that enough people exhibit uh, that contain enough similarities that a word describing the phenomenon is useful and maybe necessary to further our understanding. And historically, that word has been addiction. So these folks argue, let's keep the word. Let's get rid of the pejorative connotations and the labels, but the word itself is still useful. I think I agree with that. And that's also what Maya does in her book. Okay, so what is addiction? If you've listened to my show before, you've probably heard me say that to a large degree, addiction is a cultural projection imposed upon individuals resulting in a negative self-identity that manifests problematic drug use, which may never have been there in the beginning. We tell people who use drugs that they're sick, they've got a problem, they don't have control, all this negative stuff. We ban drugs, we put people in prison for using them, we send teenagers to re-education camps, the topic of my previous episode. We do all this and more, and it helps shape a person's self-perception, particularly when they're young, And when you're constantly being told there's something wrong with you by your family and your society, you can start believing it and start manifesting the behaviors that are being put on you, even if you weren't using drugs problematically to start. I sometimes call this cultural gaslighting. Because of our anti-drug culture, we as a society end up creating the very problem we think we're solving. And really, my entire career has been built around trying to stop this process. That's what I'm trying to do with this podcast. Fight those anti-drug beliefs. Let people know they're okay. You're okay. I'm okay. Drugs are okay. Drugs are great, in fact. They changed my life positively. 
I still use a number of psychoactive drugs regularly, and they help me. And most likely, so do you. But I'd be kidding myself if I thought addiction was only a cultural projection. Obviously, there's more to it, and people can and do develop problematic drug use even when nobody's telling them they have a drug problem. So something more is going on, and that's what today's episode is all about. What is addiction, and are you addicted? So I've been drinking every night since this pandemic started. I never drink during the day, never have, and usually I never drink until after 7 p.m. But since all this shit started happening, I moved that time down to 5 p.m. And then a few weeks after that, down to 4 p.m. Over the last month or so, I often start drinking right after getting back from my run. I call it my pack run, by the way, because I bring my girlfriend's two awesome dogs with me, and it's really a bonding experience. We live in the middle of these giant pecan farms, and so there's no traffic, and so I don't need leashes for them. So we just all run free together. They fucking love it. They chase squirrels, and it's like the primitive hunt that I'm sure our two species went on together for thousands of years, the pack run. But anyway, back to drinking. So I've started drinking earlier in the day, and... I drink pretty much every evening now. So what's going on? Am I becoming addicted? I never get drunk, but three and sometimes even four drinks in a night? Maybe that's too much. Sometimes it feels like it's affecting my sleep. And get this, last month I even took two days off just to prove to myself I could do it. So what the fuck is that about? Why do I feel I have to prove something to myself? Certainly that's a sign something bad is going on, right? Maybe. They say the best working definition of addiction is the persistent engagement in a behavior despite negative consequences. Well, so far for me, the only negative consequence is uh, some occasional sleep issues. And I'm not even sure if that's alcohol related or if it's just the stress of social distancing and our country's fucked up politics. That shit bothers me all the time. And it's gotten a lot worse since the pandemic. I lie asleep at night sometimes just thinking about all the Trumpers out there putting people's lives at risk because their leader thinks he can make the virus go away by ignoring it. Anyway, you're going to learn in this episode a shit ton about addiction. Maya's ideas on addiction, here, her main premise, I'll tell you, her main premise is that addiction is a learning disorder. Now, we'll get into what that means in the episode, but I want to put that in your head right now because it's really so important to understand. It has major implications, not only for understanding addiction, but for treating it. And it's hopeful it doesn't lock people into a permanent state of helplessness, because when you think about it, what can be learned can be unlearned. There's so many great moments in this interview. One of my favorites is when Maya talks about how being a fast learner or being smart can actually contribute to developing addiction. She says that was the case for her. Wow, why is that? That sounds backwards, right? Aren't smarter people supposed to be less likely to get in trouble with drugs? No, because addiction is about learning. All right, that might not make any sense yet, but listen to the episode. You'll get it. It's fascinating. There's another great part where we discuss music and what makes listening to music so amazing and how some master musicians can actually manipulate the dopamine system in our brain by playing with our expectations inside the music. Totally fascinating. You're going to love this show. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. I haven't mentioned my Patreon in a few episodes, but if you like this podcast, please consider subscribing to it at patreon.com. The first level is just $3 a month. For a bit more, you can also get some swag, like uh, drug-positive stickers. I can also send you an official replica of the DEA's anti-ecstasy patch. Yes, that's right. The DEA, in case you didn't know, has a sense of humor. They have, over the decades, produced a series of anti-drug patches, usually for their conferences. And back in 2003, they had an anti-club drugs conference. The official patch for that conference shows the Grim Reaper at a rave with glow sticks and a pacifier. I got a ton of these made. They're real embroidered patches. And I'll send you one, I think it's for a $10 subscription. $5, you get the stickers, $10, you get the stickers and the patch. Uh, It's got an iron-on backing, but I think it's best to sew it. You can put it on your jacket, your backpack, wherever. So head over to patreon.com slash drug positive and support the show and get some swag. 
And while we're talking about Patreon, I want to give two shout outs. The first is to my co-host on Drug Nonsense. Drug Nonsense is a second podcast I do with Mason Burks. We haven't done one in a while, but typically we'll review media stories about drugs, make fun of them, criticize them, point out all the nonsense. Mason is the director of the New Mexico chapter of Dance Safe, and I want to give him a major shout out because, well, one of the reasons we haven't released an episode in a while is because Mason is currently volunteering for the New Mexico Medical Reserve Corps, and he's in Gallup. Gallup, New Mexico is the center of the coronavirus outbreak in our state. And he's there doing first responder work in the mostly Native American community up there. He's working in a high school gym that they turned into a makeshift hospital for COVID patients. You may have heard of Gallup because it made national news recently after the governor like totally locked it down, right? There's so many cases up there that for a while at least, not sure if it's still happening, but for a while they wouldn't let anyone in or out. They blocked the roads. Anyway, Mason's been up there for a while now, and he recently made a Facebook post, and, well, it's not pretty. Even the volunteers are getting sick, despite the PPE. This uh, virus is so contagious, the volunteers all know they're putting themselves at risk, too. And so, Mason, this is a shout-out for you. You're amazing. Thank you for what you're doing. I love you, and I think about you every day. And the second shout-out actually goes to a new Patreon subscriber named Lise Hanlon. Lise subscribed for $50 a month, so thank you, Lise. We had a video chat last night, and it was great fun. They're an LGBTQ health worker in Queens. Queens is also an epicenter of the pandemic. And although they got sent home when the outbreak hit, they're starting work again soon. So thank you for what you do, Lise, and thank you for your generous contribution. All right, let's get right to the interview then. Here she is, recorded just prior to the pandemic, author of The Unbroken Brain, Maya Salovitz. So Maya, I have to tell you, I've been wanting you on the show for over a year now, ever since I read Unbroken Brain. I've been uh, leaving you comments on Facebook and messages, and I'm glad you finally saw my message. So it's really great to interview you. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, sure. I'm happy to be here. So let's just start, uh, you know, you, we talked on the phone yesterday and you told me that Unbroken Brain was temporarily on the New York Times bestseller. Uh, before we really get into the ideas in it, how much of an impact has it made, do you think? Like, we see a lot of changes happening now. Do you think your book made a big impact on the way, uh, as a society, we're dealing with addiction? I mean, I'm not the person to ask this question, <laughs> but um, it definitely has had an impact in terms of making people think differently about addiction. And one of the things that people who've read the book say to me is, and this is not something that I really expected, but they say, oh, it allowed me to understand my addicted family member so much better. I have so much more empathy for them and so much more connection with them and so much more of an understanding that kind of they're not doing drugs to be mean to me or to be a jerk or to be in any way um, messing up relationships on purpose. Right. A lot of people are just trying to survive emotionally themselves. And when they understand more about that struggle, it's a lot easier to be compassionate. Right. Well, that's great. I mean, that alone is a wonderful thing. How many copies have it sold so far? Um, I do not know exactly, <laughs> but definitely in the tens of thousands. Not six figures yet? Uh, no. I mean, my um, the boy who was raised as a dog is in the hundreds of thousands. Uh -huh. But this one is still going strong, so we hope that it will get there. Uh, so do I. All right. Well, let's just jump right into it um, to, in a nutshell, size up your uh, argument here, but nobody's going to understand it. Uh, we're going to have to get really into it. But essentially, you say addiction is a, a learning disorder or a developmental disorder or maybe developmental learning disorder. Can you describe what you mean by that? Sure. So addiction can't occur without learning. And this seems like a very basic fundamental point. But if you just think about it for a second, addiction is defined as compulsive drug use or other behavior that continues in the face of negative consequences. So in order to be compulsive about a drug, you have to know what that drug is. 
if I like shoot you up with a mystery drug for two weeks and I make you physically dependent on it, but I don't tell you what it is, you might crave that, but you're not going to be able to go out and be addicted to it because you don't know what it is. Um, uh-huh. And while that seems really obvious, it means that there's a fundamentally learned aspect of addiction. But that's only one of the things you have to learn yes. in order to get addicted. I mean, there's got to be a lot more than that. You have to. What I love in your book was where you associate the meaning or interpretation of the drug's feeling being as or even more important as the pharmacological a- effect of the drug itself. That when you learn that, oh, this drug makes me better or fixes me, I think you said if a drug doesn't fix you, you can't be addicted to it. Well, exactly. I mean, people aren't addicted to things they don't at least initially like. And this is one of the reasons that we get this opioid crisis so wrong, because we have this idea that everybody who experiences an opioid has this amazing feeling of floating bliss and it's better than any natural pleasure. And that's actually not true. You do it once, you'll get addicted. Yes, exactly. Some people get euphoria from opioids, and I happen to be one of those people, but we're actually a minority. There was an incredible study where they shot up a bunch of twins with fentanyl, and I don't know how this ever got passed an institutional review board, but it did, and they found that about only about a third of them really, really liked it. And These were identical twins? Uh, they were some were identical and some were fraternal because the point of the study was to see which bits were genetic and liking was pretty genetic. Mm -hmm. But you expect when you hear all these stories of opioid addiction that, you know, anybody who's exposed for a second is going to have so much bliss that they're going to want to give up the rest, you know, of their life for it. And the real issue is what is the rest of your life? Because even those people who have this amazing blissful experience most of them don't get addicted. Right. And the reason behind that tends to be that they don't want to give up their wife. They don't want to give up their kid. They don't want to give up their job. They have a sense of meaning and purpose. Things are going well for them. Euphoria is nice, but it's not meaningful in the way that all those other things tend to be. And so people tend to just be like, oh, well, that was nice. Um, or, oh, my gosh, like I could really like that too much. I'm not going to mess with it. Right. You know, that's been my experience as well. I happen to like stimulants. I actually can enjoy, you might call it recreationally, an oxy every now and then too, but I am certainly not going to ruin my life by trying to chase a euphoric feeling 24-7 and lose my income and my family and friends, right? Most people moderate their drug use because they can have a balance. So what causes some people not to maintain that balance and to let their lives get out of hand? Right. So there tend to be three major things that can cause people to be at high risk of addiction, and they often come together. So one of them is being traumatized especially if you're traumatized from a really young age. And this sets you up by changing your stress system over the time that you develop. And if you are feeling anxious and worried and everything is stressful and you're always on edge, substances that calm that are going to be way more attractive. Right. The second thing is mental illness or the predispositions for that, which can be things like a really outlying temperament. So you may be really intense or you may be not affected by anything. It's the extremes that create the risk. And those extremes, especially if combined with trauma, can then make a predisposition turn into an actual illness. And then you are distressed by these out of line feelings and you may want to self-medicate. So there's trauma, there's mental illness, and then there's also just economic despair and a sense of hopelessness and purposelessness and that you are just not part of things and are not needed. We can obviously see this when we look at what communities are hardest hit by addiction. We like to have this idea that it's equal opportunity, but it really isn't. Mm. People that are most at risk are actually um, the people on the bottom of the economic ladder and the people on the top. Now, the people on the top have much better chance of getting better, Right. but if your life is structureless uh, because of unemployment, or if your life is structureless because you don't need to work, you can end up with feeling left out and useless just as much. 
You know, a lot of good memes going around that the opposite of addiction is community, right? Um, yes. I can't recall whether you gave the Rat Park example in your book or not, but that's I the... Did. You did, yeah. That's the classic uh, refutation of the NIDA theory that addiction is a result of the drug simply hijacking your brain. Do you want to talk about uh, National Center on Drug Abuse and why you think they still buy into this, uh, I believe, discredited theory? Um, well, I actually want to give a little more credit to NIDA than that. Okay. I think they certainly recognize the influence of environmental and social factors. And just because they're going to have a biological explanation humans are social creatures and that affects our biology so i don't think they're as reductionist as okay. you were saying but they often come across that way in their published public messaging right. um and this hijacking the brain thing is something that has annoyed me forever i think basically um you know nida funded a lot of the studies that replicate rat park they uh -huh. may have even funded rat park in the first place because they're the biggest funder of addiction and drugs research in the world yeah 80 percent, i think yeah yeah and so the interesting thing is that like you know for all our complaints about them they fund research that does not support their priors right right you know, I, I think it's all about the messaging to the kids, right? They still have in their minds that we have to send this message, don't do drugs. They're too focused on prevention in the sense of creating a stigma around trying drugs, which we know doesn't work. But they'll pat right. themselves on the back and say, oh, look, we're, we're doing something positive. My shtick has always been that actually backfires. That kind of messaging creates the exact low self-esteem that contributes to addiction. Right. Well, I mean, the, the problem is that drug use is not addiction. And the vast majority of people who take the vast majority of drugs are not addicted. So, you know, even with something like heroin or crack cocaine, which are highly addictive, only about 10 to 20 percent of people who try them end up having addiction. Now, isn't that actually 10 to 20 percent of the people who use them? Because the data is from surveys that ask, have you used a particular drug within the last year? No, it's not. They have lifetime. Okay. So there is an increase then in the number of people who might become addicted if they use them more than once. Well, of course. I mean, the problem with that logic though happens to be that like you can and, and this is why the painkiller studies are so difficult. Without being a heavy user, you can't be addicted. So the category of heavy users is going to be overpopulated by the category of people who are addicted. Um, and so the correlation doesn't necessarily run in reverse. Right, right. I mean, I guess the, most, mo the vast majority of people that I know who use any given drug, even on a semi-regular basis, are not addicted. I mean, this is... Uh, no, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you also have to realize that if you talk about trying drugs, you already have a group that's selected for interest in drugs. Right. Because usually people, I mean, peer pressure sometimes, but usually people who try stuff and certainly people who try stuff repeatedly tend to like it and tend to be interested in consciousness alteration. And, and this is why we have this illusion of a gateway effect. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if I'm a deadhead, it's not just that I only like the Grateful Dead and that's the only music I will ever listen to necessarily. Now, some people are like that, but the vast majority of music lovers want to try a variety of musical experiences and they don't listen to only one instrument and one artist. Similarly, if you are interested in drugs, you may be interested in trying a range of things that have different effects on consciousness. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, lullabies turn you into deadheads. <laughs> right. The vast majority of people have listened to lullabies and they don't end up as deadheads. Um, but it does mean that you have to be able to hear music in the first place to be able to become uh, a fan of whatever musical group you should choose to become. Are you a deadhead? I am a deadhead, yes. Did you get into drugs through uh, following Grateful Dead? No, I got into the Grateful Dead through following drugs. <laughs> I see. <laughs> they have that uh, association. You want to find drugs? Well, go to a Grateful Dead show. Lots of drugs yeah, there. I mean, it was like I read the electrocolate acid test, and I had been very interested in the idea of, oh, there are these substances that can you know, alter your consciousness. And I was not happy in my consciousness a lot of the time. And I liked this idea that you could chemically change that. 
and the idea that you could feel at one with the universe and and feel connected to people because I had such a difficult time mm-hmm. with that. So I deliberately sought out psychedelics and learned by reading and talking to people that, oh, a lot of early psychedelia came out of the Grateful Dead scene. And so the Grateful Dead scene was very intertwined with the early LSD experimentation. So I'm like, okay, I got to, you know, be a deadhead. And in fact, it was really funny because I tried listening to the dead um, before I was tripping and I was going, oh, they're okay, whatever. And then somebody sat me down in front of a speaker and put live dead, the dark star into St. Stephen sequence. And after that, I was converted. I was deadhead forever. And you were tripping? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so there's something very, very real about uh, psychedelics enhancing musical appreciation. Absolutely, hands down. You know, not not just from my personal experience, but you know, we talked to, I talked literally to thousands of people about it. This is the reason why people use psychedelics when they go out to shows. So, uh, very, very fascinating. We I, I makes you think that uh, we evolved with drugs. Maybe the stoned ape theory is correct that psilocybin led to the expansion of our consciousness as well as to the appreciation of music because we're the only species that appreciates that. Music is a really, really interesting thing because it really does change your mood and it really does have profound spiritual effects. And I mean, I, I often feel like I couldn't live without music. Oh, yeah. I can live without drugs, but I cannot live without music. It is yeah, um, yeah. a fundamental piece of my being or something. So, I mean, so it's, it's interesting because psychedelics and marijuana tend to allow you to focus on specific bits within the music in ways that you don't necessarily do when you are in a more normal frame of consciousness. Now, probably musicians are practiced at doing this and they can do this sober or whatever state they happen to be in. But there's a focusing effect that that happens. And there's a, one of the reasons I think humans like music is that it is predictable, but unpredictable. And our brains are constantly trying to predict what's going to happen next. And when we get it right, we get a hit of dopamine. You know, you are so correct about that. The music that makes me ripple the most is the ones that I've heard it just enough times that I kind of can remember what's going to happen next. And there's even some bands that will kindle a riff to sort of make your brain start to anticipate it before they give you the full effect at the end. And it's amazing when it happens. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes they mess with you. And what's what's even better than accurately predicting, which is good and soothing, is when you mispredict, but it's better than you predict. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so sometimes, the, especially the dead, or some of these jam bands will do this where they will tease a theme for a very, very long time, then maybe go in a completely different direction, and then come back yeah. to it and then you're like oh. <laughs> <laughs> you are so right oh my god i'm feeling high already just having this conversation it's music really funny. yeah yeah sex drugs and rock and roll right indeed indeed all right let's go let's go back to addiction though because really that's what your book sure. is all about here and you talked about trauma okay that's understood you also mentioned mental illness and along with that you said an outlying temperament, either overreaction or not reacting in within a normal range. You write personally that you are on the autism spectrum, maybe, I don't know if they use high functioning, Asperger, something like that, right? So do you think this contributed to your own addiction experience? And in what way? Was it that you didn't feel things like you thought you should? And then what role did being told that you're an outlier also impact your sense of self and your desire to change who you are with drugs? So, I mean, I was always a very weird kid. I was reading at three, which makes you weird by definition. And so I was interested in things that other kids weren't interested in. And the things that other kids were interested in, I was not interested. So I Mm -hmm. felt myself as an outlier very early. And that certainly was a real thing. The other thing is that for me, being on the spectrum means that I have sensory overload a lot. So lights are too bright, sounds are too loud. I can't deal with crowds of people. There's just a kind of intensity that's overwhelming. And it's interesting because you sometimes seek that. 
and you can like put yourself at a Grateful Dead concert, which is total sensory overwhelm. But you have chosen to put yourself in that situation and you know what the things are in that situation. If somebody forces that on you, um, it's more like torture. And mm-hmm. so for a long time as a kid, I just wasn't able to regulate my responses to my sensory experience. So, you know, a little itchy fabric would drive me crazy or, um, you know, a noise in the background or just all kinds of sensory experiences were difficult. I I think what happened is that like most people, when they have a sort of slightly irritating experience, they tolerate to it really quickly. And I don't tend to do that. And I think that's actually possibly uh, connected to that I learn things really quickly, but it's really bad because it sensitizes me to things in ways that I should instead be tolerizing to and not paying attention to anymore. Uh-huh. And, and this led to or increased your chance of becoming addicted how? So basically, I was I became very depressed and very unhappy about my inability to connect socially. And I, you know, always had like many people on the spectrum, I had some kind of obsessive interest and, Mm -hmm. you know, for a while it was like opera, for a while it was science fiction, Um, I was a Trekkie, Um, I was, you know, just into weird things. Now, of course, nowadays, these things are huge fandoms and I wouldn't have been such an outlier, but back then, I was, especially as a girl, I really was an outlier and, and I felt like nobody liked me and I couldn't connect with anybody. And then, you know, I started reading about drugs and I started reading about the Grateful Dead and the hippies and the communes and the connections and the spirituality and all of this stuff around, oh, we're all together and we're going to make change in the world and we're going to do good things. Um, And I thought, that's what I want. I feel really bad that I missed the 60s, but the dead are still around. Uh And so once I actually developed an obsessive interest in drugs, that helped me socialize even when I wasn't high because now I was like the drug expert. And that was a subject that people actually did want to hear me talk about. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I could, you know, I could use that to like have something to feel like I was socially participating. Um, That is not the ideal way to do it necessarily, but um, I, that is indeed what happened. Uh Uh-huh. You didn't have trauma or, or a high degree of trauma in your childhood, though. Other than, you know, it's like people have tried to convince me that I do. Um, I mean, my dad was a Holocaust survivor, so that definitely was traumatic. Um, And he was um, he was profoundly depressed. And so that does count as a uh, experience. So this brings up epigenetics, which I do want to get into. But around the issue of trauma, the reason I bring it up is because Gabor Mate, yeah. who I'm sure you know, has said well, many times. He's trying to convince me that I'm traumatized. He's the um, one. Yeah, he's a, he, he has said many times, inevitably, 100%, right, trauma. You, you can't I, become addicted unless you've experienced trauma. And a lot of parents have rebelled around this, dealing with their children right, and, who are suffering addiction because they know there wasn't deep trauma in, the, in their child's life. And there's, there's two answers to that. One is that if you are extremely oversensitive to all kinds of stimuli, mild experiences might be perceived as traumatic. So in that sense, you could say I was traumatized. You could broaden the definition of trauma to include the inner experience of even events that might not be considered traumatic for most people. Sure. Right. But, but I, I think I, I think the pro- first of all, the parents interpret it that way because they feel like the only kind of trauma is child abuse or neglect. And so they feel like that that is blaming them. That sure, I understand. By traumatizing their kid. Right. Now you can realize that, like, there's all kinds of other traumas, like being bullied, which definitely happened to me, mm-hmm. um, and like, you know, uh, natural disasters or car accidents or your parent dies, you know, things that are not in their control. Right. <laughs> and so I don't think there is a unicausal explanation for addiction. And so this is why when somebody says the opposite of addiction is connection or the everybody with addiction has trauma, I have to push back a little bit. I think that for many people, the opposite of addiction is connection. And social stuff is really important to recovery for a large percent of people. And trauma is really important to the causality of addiction for many people, but not all. Because if we go to these oversimplified ways of seeing, we will end up erasing people's experience and we will end up then creating another one size fits all that doesn't.
Right. And thank you for saying that. You know, I've always felt that heightened stress response may be even a greater predictor than trauma to risk of addiction. And some children are just born with a higher stress response. We look at the borderline spectrum of personality disorders, for example. Right. And, and I, I can't remember if you talk about borderline in your book. I do not actually, because um, that there are just too many things to talk about. But um, but it's definitely the case that people with borderline are more prone to addiction, and they have the kind of emotional dysregulation uh, that you might have said I had when I was a kid. Now, how you get from that dysregulation to borderline, nobody really knows. But it's certainly the case that some people, when faced with sort of sensory chaos, have these sort of extreme bouncing emotional reactions that make it very difficult for Mm -hmm. them to connect with others. I would never compare borderline to the uh, autism. I think they're wholly different syndromes. There are people in the same family who have both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And that would make things even more complicated. Yeah. Right. One is autistic, one's borderline. They may have come to that from the same genetic place, but they ended up developmentally in different disorders. Mm -hmm. Um, And the thing that I find really interesting about development and why I argue that addiction is developmental is that there are little influences at specific points of development that can end up having a huge impact that would have no impact at a different point. Right. And one of these influences might nudge you sort of to the borderline pathway and one might nudge you towards the autism spectrum pathway, but you might have started with the same vulnerability. And there's a lot of interesting research showing that a lot of the psychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders, there's a common risk. So the same risk factor might give you uh, schizophrenia or might give you bipolar or might give you borderline or might get, you know, it's like some risk for your development to go awry, but it goes awry in different ways. Do you really think that borderline and autism spectrum, uh, just forget about schizophrenia, but even just those two have a identical genetic cause that then diverges? <laughs> I'm not, I am not saying that. I'm just saying that the, it's, I'm basically saying that neurodevelopment is insanely complex. Yes, I can agree with that. (laughs) The place where you start out may with, let's say you start out with one kind of vulnerability, it may leave you vulnerable to many different things depending on your developmental experience. This doesn't mean that everybody who has autism is also at risk for borderline or any of that kind of thing. The problem with all of this and the reason that it gets so complicated is, aside from the fact that the brain is the most complicated thing in the known universe, is that there are many different ways to get to most of these outcomes. And so if there was a gene for autism or a gene for schizophrenia, we would have found it by now. It's clearly many different things that cause many different types of risk. And for one person, a gene that may cause schizophrenia might cause autism. <laughs> you know, it's just weird. But if you look at the if you look at the concentration of problems in particular families, you can see that it doesn't all come out the same way, even though there's a lot of genetic similarity. Now, obviously not all of them have the same genes. And one of the other incredibly complicating factors is that the way the brain wires itself is somewhat random. And so even identical twins, their brains are not wired the same way because, you know, when synapse A went to synapse C, it just happened because of a chemical gradient that happened to be there. And for the other one, that chemical gradient went the other direction. Right. Uh, There is a name for this, the butterfly effect or, or, you know, where a small environmental trigger can produce a large change. I forgot what that... uh, that name is. But I think it's really reflected in this idea that we were born with such a tremendous overabundance of neurons. And then the ones that we utilize uh, remain, become strengthened, and even physically those areas grow. And the ones that we don't use, they kind of shrivel up and go away. This is how we have evolved to adapt to such a wide variety of environments and probably why, as humans, we've taken over the world. Well, Uh, the, the, the word for when one gene gives you a risk for multiple different problems or multiple different outcomes is called pleiotropy. 
Uh huh. Yeah, it wasn't what I was looking for. It, it was yeah, like. Yeah, I was, and I, yeah, um, the butterfly effect is, is, um, has to do with chaos theory, but I'm not going to yeah. name that right now. <laughs> yeah, one little thing can happen. You know, it, when talking about paraphilias, it's interesting that, um, they are almost entirely in men, right? A, a sexual kink that becomes the only way a person can become aroused, right? Yes. And uh, I was reading a book where they were interviewing a man who had um, whatever it's called, where he was attracted to stumps. Uh, what's the word? Right. Uh, I forget the name uh, for that. Uh, uh, amputations, right? Yes. And 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 he he. He traced it back. He was talking to his therapist and he could trace it back to a time when he was prepubescent where a friend of the family came over and she had a cast on her leg and his father puts his hand on the cast and says, so when's it coming off? And as a little kid, he misinterpreted that as when is the leg coming off, not when is the cast coming oh, off. And there, might, and there was some flirtation going on with his father and this woman. And so for whatever the reason, that little butterfly flapping its wings at that moment totally hijacked his sexual development, and he could only then, as an adult male, become aroused through fantasizing about amputees. So, you know, maybe with sexuality, that's uh, weird or whatever, but this uh, same phenomenon, I think, happens uh, all the time with all of us in a lot of other ways. We develop our own ideas and our ideas about drugs and our and what they do to us uh, can also happen in this regard. So this is, I think, what you mean by a learning disorder. Yes, and, and, and especially developmental because the way development unfolds over time is that your brain is sort of prepared for specific influences and specific types of developmental tasks at different times. So, you know, the stuff that you are occupied with as a toddler is going to be very different than the stuff you're occupied with as a teenager. But right. you are learning very specific tasks and the brain areas relevant to those tasks are developing, especially at those particular periods. And so those are called sensitive periods. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that sort of makes me believe that addiction is a developmental disorder is that overwhelmingly 90% of all addiction starts in the late teens or early 20s. And this is true of like a lot of different mental illnesses, depression, schizophrenia, Lots of things don't really come on very heavy in childhood, but they suddenly appear at that time when the brain is sort of finishing the development of the cortex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and other developmental disorders like autism appear really early and you can see it in like a tiny child. Right. It's interesting and it gives you a clue about what areas are likely to be affected. Right, right. You know, would it be fair to say that... Um in a way we mind fuck ourselves into becoming addicted by our own beliefs about what the drug's doing to us? Well, I think it's more about our own beliefs about who ourselves are. I think mm -hmm. kids can get very distorted ideas about themselves that parents do not mean to give them. But mm -hmm. like somehow I decided that I was like a very bad person because I was selfish and I decided I was selfish because I kind of needed to order the environment to deal with my sensory stuff. And so I was bossy and I wanted things my way. And so I felt that that made me a bad person. And, you know, I was gifted kid or whatever. And the, you know, my parents were like trying to make distinctions between the siblings. And it was like, you know, this is a smart one and this is the kind one. Uh -huh. So I thought because I'm smart, I can't be good. And I just hated myself because I thought like the thing that really matters is to be a good person. And I'm not and I'm never going to be and I'm congenitally bad. And that obviously contributed to a great desire to have anesthesia. Uh-huh. Uh, so how and you were in that adolescent age when you started using heroin and heroin was the first or cocaine was the first drug that you developed problems oh, with. Oh, no, no. I did a ton of psychedelics. And yeah, yeah. But did, did you think you have problems with the psychedelics? Oh, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I definitely had a problem with cocaine before I had a problem okay. with heroin. Right. Um, right. But um, heroin was definitely my drug of choice. What, right, right. And how long did your addiction experience last total? So um, basically from around 18 or 19 to about 23 and is that pretty normal? Is that it's five, six years? Um, I think, 
you know, I probably recovered a little earlier, but I had a sort of very intense crash course. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of people do end up recovering in their mid to late 20s. Mm -hmm. um, I was, like I said, a little bit early, but that was kind of characteristic of me throughout my life. <laughs> right. But um, at age, say, 23 to 25 or even a little bit later, that is when your cortex is finally getting its most sophisticated control over the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so you might argue that aging out of addiction, which, you know, about half of addictions end by the age of 30 or 35, if you're talking about alcohol, what's going on there is that perhaps you don't have the impulse control to get things in hand until your brain reaches that point of development. Mm -hmm. Now, you could argue that your brain doesn't reach that de part of development until you are able to, it's kind of like a um, catch-22, but I don't think we know the causal pathway there. Regardless of that, the fact is that at the time when most people's lives are becoming more structured and the this developmental stuff is happening with the brain, a lot of people do recover. Right. What do you credit your own recovery to? And what do you think the best forms of treatment or support we can give to help others recover? Well, I think it's impossible to know because I don't have like 20 identical twins um, who went different approaches. Um, and I don't even know if that would be a high enough number. Um, <laughs> What's your memory of your recovery? Well, I mean, I know that I went to a rehab and I did the 12-step thing for a while and I, you know, I had lots of different experiences. I know that antidepressants were super helpful to me, uh -huh. but I wouldn't begin to say that that's the one true way for everybody because the thing that is important in all kinds of developmental disorders is that because it's so complicated, everybody's case is different. And... Mm -hmm. There's many people for whom 12-step programs are horrible. There's many people for whom 12-step programs are wonderful. But wait, um, they're, they're better numbers than many. They fail the vast majority, right? But everything kind of fails the vast yeah, majority. Yeah, yeah. Except for um, when you were talking about the specific case of opioids, we have two medications that cut the death rate by 50% or more. These are methadone and buprenorphine, and heroin probably works as well, as long as it's pharmaceutically and safely and regularly right. supplied. But we know that behavioral treatment alone in an environment full of fentanyl puts you at great risk of dying when yeah. you relapse. And most people will experience at least one relapse. So for opioids, we have to very much stress the importance of staying on medication for a good long time. Right. And, you know, hopefully we will get into a better environment. Um, but right now that is for if people are facing opioid addiction, I can't in good conscience say, oh, you should definitely go for abstinence right away because like that gives that doubles your risk of dying. And I don't want to do that. Right. I've been an advocate for medication assisted treatment and particularly for heroin assisted treatment. And I don't even call it treatment. I say it's it's simply uh, heroin maintenance. And well, yeah, and I, I hate that assisted thing because we don't have Prozac assisted treatment for depression. Prozac is treatment for depression. <laughs> right. Uh, and like if you wanted to say anything's doing the assisting in terms of medication treatment for addiction, it's the counseling doing the assisting. So it should be CAT, counseling assisted uh -huh. treatment. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things about heroin treatment that I was fascinated by in your book is the complexity and nuance around tolerance versus sensitivity. It's not exactly what people think it is. It's just fascinating. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, for example, taking your heroin at the same time, the same dose every day, which is how all medication-assisted treatment uh, tries to be, yeah. helps the user produce a tolerance, and that tolerance is good. That tolerance is what you want, right? Yeah. And uh, talk about that a little bit. Sure, sure. So I was saying earlier that I probably personally tend to sensitize rather than tolerize, and this is a good thing for certain kinds of learning and a bad thing for addictive learning. So it's the pattern of experience, not the substance, that determines whether you're going to sensitize or tolerize. Now, certain substances have certain different qualities, but let's just talk about opioids for a moment. 
if you take the same dose of the same drug at the same time in the same place every day, you will become tolerant to it and you may end up escalating your dose and you may end up at a dose that would kill me, but you are completely unimpaired by because you have the tolerance from taking it in that regular steady pattern now the reason it escalated would be a different thing but let's just say we've got a person who's in a stable place they're taking the same amount they found the amount that keeps them in a good place where they're not nodding out or they're not dope sick so they're at a stable tolerant place in contrast if you take a substance in a chaotic pattern with increasing doses and decreasing doses in different times, in different places, in different situations. Um, and unknown doses. You don't know what the dose is exactly, going to be. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the, you know, there's this incredible and horrifying experiment that they did with mice or rats. It was some kind of rodent. Um, and they gave them some kind of opioid. I think it was heroin. It might have been morphine. But anyway, like they gave them the same dose in the same cage at the same time every day. And then they put them in a different cage and gave them um, that dose and about half of them overdosed. Mm -hmm. Just from moving them to a different location. Just because like what happens is, and this is another aspect of addiction being a learned thing, your body gets cues that say, okay, the dose is coming, put the tolerance up. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're not in the environment where those cues are, they may not happen. And this is why like a lot of people you know, if you start drinking a completely different alcoholic drink that you usually drink and you're at a new bar with like new people, you may get way more drunk than you expected. Hmm. And that's because the cues for tolerance were not activated. Now, it'd be nice to be able to play with this so you could choose to get wasted by novelty. (laughs) (laughs) Be be cheaper. Yeah, exactly. Uh, But I don't think we've really worked that out yet. Um, But it definitely is the case that tolerance is in part learned and it relies on cues. And that means, especially if you have, say, just come out of jail or just come out of treatment and you are using again, be really, really, really careful. Take a quarter of what you used to take, if Mm -hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because God knows what's in it. So the, you know, it, so yeah, so, but I mean, but the pattern of experience has a lot to do with how addictive it is. And so if we just, because gambling addiction, for example, is simply an addiction to a pattern of experience right? and it, it's a pattern of randomly rewarding you. <laughs> right. And when rewards are completely unpredictable, your brain that wants to do that predicting thing gets kind of driven crazy by it, especially if it seems almost predictable because you kind of feel like you almost got the algorithm. And so then you end up, you know, um, with a gambling addiction, which is not good. But what's interesting about that is that there's no drug. This is completely about a patterning of experience. Mm -hmm. And it can be just as addictive and cause just as much harm to people as a substance. So it seems like the variable unknown doses on the opioid street market today combined with the stigma that causes many people who use opioids to use at random times whenever they can find it and whatever locations they can find is the worst possible situation for someone uh, who wants to use opioids. Well, yes. I mean, it's interesting because some of the overdose um, that we are assuming is caused by fentanyl may be caused by novelty. Uh, We know how much of the death is due to this conditioned effect. And so, I mean, especially with these weird fentanyls that are out there, like, you know, one day you're shooting brown powder that smells this way, the next day it's green. Like, um, you know, there's actually really study with with alcohol where different colored alcohol actually affected tolerance Um, yeah this is so fascinating to me it's almost like the tolerance and sensitivity is not a linear relationship between the up and down regulation of the receptors for a given drug those receptors can up and down regulate for a variety of reasons and someone could overdose and die on a lower dose of a drug because there are random factors that are in their life that are different now. 
Well, and see, this is the thing. This is, again, why learning matters, because the reason sensitization and tolerance exist is for learning. So if we were always reacting as if everything was completely novel, we couldn't learn anything, right? Yeah, right. And on the other hand, if you're sort of over, always reacting as, as if everything is the same and dull and there's nothing new, you can't learn either. It's a balance between these two things and how quickly you respond versus how, um, you know, how much. So anyway, so the point of that is that, like, the those processes are there not to get you addicted to drugs. They're there to get you to be able to learn from the environment. And this is why this becomes so complicated. Mm hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, so can I ask you, uh, since your recovery at 23, have you used cocaine or heroin, the two drugs that you had no. problems with? Not, no. not since, have, huh? And how, no, not. Not I once. Have, I, have, I have had alcohol uh -huh. and I have had weed in places where it's legal, but I have not. And I, I have, you know, and, and I actually had... Um, for some dental work, I had some probably coding or something like that. Um, and it was really interesting because that was when I was very much into total abstinence, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to get through this procedure without something. Right. And so I had, I think it was my sponsor. I had somebody hold it or, you know, when I was calling. <laughs> it, I was like, uh -huh. But the funny thing was when I, when I took it, I was like, really, this is what I liked? Like, this is kind of boring. Um, uh -huh. Like, now, it was not heroin, mind you, but it was still an opioid, and I still had that opioid feeling, but it just, because my life had become so much more fulfilling and so much more comfortable, and I felt so much more connected to people, because the connections that we have to people are opioid-mediated. Like, the reason mm -hmm. that we have opioids in our body is not just for pain relief, it's primarily to connect you to your mom and connect you to your dad and connect you to your partner. Right, <laughs> and right. so when we feel safe in relationships, we get an opioid experience, uh -huh. and if we don't, we feel anxious and kind of withdrawal. -like. Right, right. Okay, so given that, what is your opinion on the ethics and or effectiveness of drugs like Vivitrol? Well, I personally wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole because um, I feel like what would happen... So Vivitrol is an opioid antagonist. Mm -hmm. This means it, pre it prevents not only external opioids like drugs, but your endogenous opioids, your natural opioids that give exactly. you... Exactly. It's going to prevent you from the experiencing those bonding effects through your natural this social... Is what you would think. However, people are weird. Our wiring varies tremendously. I find it very hard to believe that there is a large number of people who become addicted to opioids who actually need to have their opioid system tamped down. But there may be some. And there's certainly, while there are definitely, like I interviewed a, a woman who was um, on Vivitrol, um, she was forced onto it, and she was a bass player, and she didn't want to, it just didn't interest, like she was just no pleasure in it. Yeah. Uh, and that's really horrifying, right? Yes. There are people who've taken it and find it perfectly fine. Huh. You know, and so what I always say to people, if they, you know, because if you stay on it, it can be protective against opioids. If you, but the two weeks when you are, when the dose is starting to get out of your body, you are at super high risk. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason you can't be on maintenance and it doesn't work for you and you want some protection in case you relapse, and you do a trial of oral naltrexone for a couple days so that it's not you're not stuck with it for a month. Right. If you try it for a couple days and it's fine, then get the shot. You know, right. because I don't you know, like I personally and, and I know that this is somewhat superstitious, but I just like, ooh, I don't want to go anywhere near anything that messes with that, you know? Yeah. But again, like the thing about the brain is it's complicated and there's all kinds of loops. And for some reason, some people may do better on these. Well, do you think it might be that it relieves them of the feeling of responsibility or, or the, the temptation? It relieves them of the well, temptation. Some, yeah. yeah, some people some people say that. The problem with that is that the vast majority of people with addiction are polydrug addicted. Mm -hmm. So you certainly wouldn't be able to get high from opioids, but you could get high from methamphetamine or cocaine. Right. Well, now they're working on a cocaine vaccine. I just read an and article about that. And vaccine for all of these things. And it's ridiculous. It's a dumb idea. I believe like, it. Yeah. It's a horrifying idea. Well, the thing is that, like, okay, first of all, we don't even know how long it'll last. 
Second of all, we don't know what it does with your immune system, which is problematic given that like people with addictions may have immune issues. But we can't give people a vaccine for cocaine when they're like a child and then they could never get high on it. That's just not possible with these things. The point of them is supposed to be to make it so that you don't have the temptation because you know it wouldn't work. And so that then if you did try, you tried it a few times, you would get deconditioned, you would not, you would learn that it doesn't work. And you would then, um, so basically the problem is virtually all of these treatments like antabuse, like Vivitrol, like these vaccines, they work great for people who are super high motivated, but people who are super, super high motivated do well if you just tell them to stand on their head for two weeks. Like, in, um, <laughs> in, you know, that group of patients we already know how to treat. Um, not suggesting standing. Don't head try head. this at home, people. <laughs> um, I, what I mean is, is that you have a serious selection bias problem with the research in these areas, and that we need treatments for people who aren't highly motivated and who are ambivalent and who are not you know, who are very unhappy about their drug use, but feel out of control. Right. Well, so what about heroin maintenance and what I have said, which is I think it works because it's not treatment at all. You're just allowing someone to obtain pure known dose heroin up to three times a day at a clinic, not take home, administered by a doctor or nurse, and they develop a tolerance, whatever anxiety or heightened stress response led them to self-medicate with street heroin uh, is still in effect, and they're able to live long, happy, normal lives using high-dose heroin every day, no pretense of quitting, no judgment or stigma that you are an addict. Uh, it, does this uh, just kind of blow apart the whole notion of addiction and treatment? No. The, because, this system is working in Switzerland, right? Like, so, okay, so there was the old British system in the UK where you could go to a doctor and say, I'm addicted to heroin. Okay, here's a prescription. You know, come pick up once a month and blah. Now, the research on that showed, unfortunately, that it didn't help. It didn't reduce the death rate the way something more controlled, like you're talking about, you're going there a couple times right. a day. But that's obviously extremely controlling. Like you can't travel, <laughs> you can't work. Um, and so what I think happens when any form of maintenance works, whether, and what's, what I find very interesting about the, the more recent heroin maintenance trials is that only about three to 5% of people who are in the um, heroin addicted population are allowed into these trials. And even when you start to expand it, it seems that what I guess what I'm trying to say is that the majority of people actually seem reasonably well served by methadone or buprenorphine and that it's only a small majority of the people who benefit from the heroin treatment. Now, one might argue that you should expand it to a much less severe population or whatever, but there's clearly a trade-off between giving people exactly what they want and some degree of control. And so you don't want a complete free-for-all pill mill kind of situation, right. but you also don't want you have to show up three times a day because you can't get on with your life. I think when heroin maintenance works, what's happening is several different things. In many cases, when you get exactly what you want, like let's say your book becomes a New York Times bestseller, um, <laughs> you think you're going to be happy forever and like all your life problems will be solved. <laughs> oh, and it didn't happen? <laughs> no, it does not happen that way. <laughs> and so um, whether it's getting all the heroin you want or getting the big success that you want, you, um, it doesn't fix you and you have to deal with yourself. And so, especially if you've spent your entire, you know, every, the structure of every day is you get up, you have to get money, you have to get heroin, you have to, you know, and it's just, that is your career. You don't have time to do anything else. Now, suddenly you have that it's free. You don't have to like hustle for money and you've got to deal with yourself. Right. <laughs> and so right. like, I think that's how the change happens. I think that like 
it's partially the business of you get exactly what you want and it doesn't fix you. And it's partially the business of suddenly you have free time to deal with what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're not, you know, anxious or stressed or worried about your next fix. Now you can, if you had trauma issues, you can begin to address them. Or if your problem is like long-term unemployment, you could go back to school. Or if you are disconnected from your family, you can actually show up. And, you know, so I I think that's a lot of what happens. Um, I think we obviously need a lot more research and um, see how far we can expand it and how much we can individualize so that like we don't have this insanely paternalistic, you have to go three times a day kind of thing. I tend to think that the best maintenance systems will work in a way where you have complete low threshold, like you show up, you get a dose Mm -hmm. and that's it. Nothing required of you. If you don't show up tomorrow, that's fine. But if you want today, you're not going to have to hustle. You can do that sheer harm reduction. Anyone? Or you have to prove that yeah, you-, you have to be addicted yeah, because yeah. I don't think I'm going to like, I don't think <laughs> I want to go. There. <laughs> Let's go get some methadone before the show tonight. Why not? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this, this could be very dangerous and I definitely don't want to go there. Um, yeah. So, okay. So we start, and I'm talking about an opioid maintenance system, right. obviously here. So you have this like low threshold thing just for people who want to break. And then it's hooking them up with services if they feel like it, they could, you know, go into, and then you have your sort of more traditional, more structured, more pain in the butt kind of thing where you have to show up and you have to do this and you have to do that because your goal at that point, you're choosing to have the goal of stabilizing and you're choosing to have the goal of, I want to sort my life out and you're not forced to go to things, but you are given the opportunity to have structure that works for you. Right. So let's say you get through this and now you've dealt with your trauma issues, you're working, your life is good. Now you don't need to show up every day. You should just pick up your script once a month like anybody else, like if you're on Prozac. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So you have the like low threshold bits at both ends, but they're different because at the end where somebody's already stable, you really don't want to be keeping that person under a system of control that's basically like being on probation. Right. Yeah. But a lot of people are worried about participants diverting the drugs to others, though. Right. So it's a political issue that we have to deal with that way. Yes. That like so that's why you have the like sort of high control, low threshold thing where you go and you have the dose there and like that. And for the people who have clearly demonstrated by going through the whole stabilization process that they are in good shape and they can handle homes and et cetera. You don't need to like exert that level of paternalism over that. Right. You know, we, we've only been talking about the individual and their personal recovery, though uh, that uh, I have read is not the reason Switzerland impl- introduced widespread heroin maintenance. It was to actually remove all the heroin users from the street market to put dealers out of business, dry up the illegally available heroin, and uh, have far fewer new addicts. Right. So there's a sociological yes. impact in removing all of the heroin users from the street market by giving them heroin in clinics. Right. But what turned out like the thing that I still think is weird in Switzerland is it's still a tiny proportion of their people with heroin addiction that are on heroin maintenance. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Tiny. It's how how not, tiny? Like, it's, it's sort of 80 or 90 percent that are on like methadone or buprenorphine. Oh, oh I like, see what you mean. Still, a majority of the yeah. people using opioids are in the system somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. They have widespread medication-assisted treatment, and that's why it's working well, Wh- whatever it is. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I do think that there is something to the idea of if you provide people with the drugs you want, they want, they won't be selling to their friends because their friends can get it for free too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, right. the diversion issue goes away if, if there's no market, right? Exactly. Um, And so, you know, so, and we've seen this in, in Holland too, where you have a a decent maintenance system. And so it removes that pressure to sell the drug to others that could, you know, sort of get new users into things. Now, I'm not so sure, like in my experience using heroin, I never tried to like get new users into it. Like, and the people around me actually discouraged me, Uh like, I didn't find this like business of like, 
oh, like, this is so great. Come and try it and join us and also be a junkie. Like, I didn't, that is not yeah. what I experienced. But it, in did you, scene. you didn't need to sell to buy, to afford your own uh, drugs? Well, right? no, no, I certainly did, but I sell, I sold to pre existing users. Oh, oh, oh I see. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> you had a little shame. <laughs> you had well, a little I shame. I actually sold cocaine, but I didn't uh -huh. like. I wasn't, you know, the time when I would turn people on to cocaine would only be well before I got into trouble with it. Right. Once you get, in, and and that's where you know when when you've got, and but those people are never in treatment. Like if you've got yeah. somebody who's just in the first glow of this is the best thing ever. I want everybody to try it. Um, you know, and then they think it's good, so they don't think it's immoral to sell it, and blah blah. Um, you know. Um, those people are sort of in their first flush of new use. Like you are not going to, those people are not going to be in contact with treatment services in any yeah. kind of way yeah. I can imagine. And most uh, of them are never going to descend into addiction either. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So let's say we're talking about people on the other end who have already become to, addicted to the point where they're injecting. Right. And it's a daily thing. Yep. Those people, in my experience anyway, rarely want to indoctrinate new users. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of skeptical of the idea that, that that happens a lot. Certainly new users get into it, but I don't think they get in from that end. Well, it's not just that. It's that whoever is dealing, you can make a lot of money if you're dealing high doses to lots of people that are using every day, the, uh, the addicts, right? But if, the, yeah, if they... If they no longer are coming to buy from you because they're getting it free from the government, then you could try to push it on to new people, but you're not going to make nearly as much money because they're not using high doses every day. And so you essentially put dealers out of business, the ones that are serving everybody. Yes, yeah. no. And I mean, I can, I can definitely see that. I just, um, I mean, I don't know enough about the existing heroin market in Switzerland to say whether it has worked as completely as claims are made. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I like to believe it works great. I always use it as an example, but, you know, I don't really know either. <laughs> well, you know what I, I mean? Like, the thing is, like, when you actually look at these things up close, which I have uh -huh. done with a lot of things, not Switzerland, but the UK and um, Portugal a little bit, um, you know, it's like, yes, harm reduction works. It works amazingly. It does really good things. But is it a panacea? No. And we shouldn't pretend that it's going to completely eliminate the illegal market or that, you know, um, everybody who gets on a heroin script is going to get stable and not be chaotic. Right. Right. All right. What do, what do you know about meth and sex? Particularly now, there's a lot of talk about chem sex. There's people right. writing articles, especially in the gay community. You get that testosterone, you add a strong dopamine releaser, and a lot of people are becoming addicted to methamphetamine, maybe in a different kind of way, and all the issues around it are very different. And I bring this up, too, because that was my problematic uh, drug of choice for about nine months when I was in my 20s, too. And it also involved sex, right? right so, right. you know, I don't think it had to do with my self-identity. I, I was going through a divorce, and and so there was like a little bit of an escape uh, going on. I didn't want to deal with what was happening in my life, you know, using the meth to avoid grieving. But it seems like a lot of people get in trouble with meth because they're just kind of using it for sex now. I mean, it's interesting because I do think that most of the people who get in real trouble with meth around sex, and this is not my area of expertise, but from what I know about this, from what I've read and talking to gay men, is that, okay, especially gay men who are like in their 40s and 50s or older, they live through AIDS. Right. <laughs> Some of them are HIV positive. They lost their entire phone book a lot of times. There is a lot of unresolved trauma in that community. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the like fun sex stuff, when it becomes no longer so fun, is about that. And so I don't know how to deal with that, but I think that the gay community is beginning to deal with that. And I think that one of the things that people in the harm reduction community really need to watch out for is that people in, you know, who are like in their 50s or 40s now, who came through, like, especially in New York or San Francisco, the AIDS days, and now people are overdosing 
again, there's like all that trauma that could lead some people to relapse or could lead to some kind of compulsive issues for people. So I think, you know, again, there's probably plenty of gay men who like have a fun amount of sex that I can't imagine as a female. Um, but uh, maybe there's other women that can, but not me. Um, <laughs> but if, if you, uh, this is just not the way my sexuality works, but um, I'm sure it's not completely gendered. Anyway, um, if you are just sort of having an enormous amount of chem sex and it's fun, you're not going to let it destroy your life. On the other hand, if this is coming from a place of homophobia or, um, self-hatred or um, trauma or any of the million things that people are kind of anesthetizing themselves this way, right? then it's a problem. And I think that um, stimulants can escalate people's natural compulsive behavior. And so if you yep. already have a little tendency towards compulsivity, which I clearly did, you can get stuck in loops of this thing um, that is pharmacological. Because I mean, for me, at least with cocaine, there came a point where I was doing it and I knew it would suck and I couldn't stop. Right. And I would shoot it up and be like, this is going to suck. I really don't want to do this. Boom. You know, okay. <laughs> this is going to suck again. I'm going to do it again. Like it was, right. Horrible. Right. you know, like that never happened with opioids, but with stimulants, like it's like that distinction between liking and wanting gets so dissociated. Right. Right. I, I think with stimulants, with chem sex, there's also a type of learning process that goes on where you convince yourself that you are having the most pleasurable sex you've ever had, and then you start to believe that you, can, you can't experience those great highs, those great orgasms, that immense arousal without the drug. Maybe you really can, but you've associated it so much as, that as soon as you smoke that meth, first thing you want to do is have sex. Right. Well, and I can I can totally see how um, getting rid of those cues and that kind of learning could be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you'd obviously have to, like, try to do whatever kind of interesting things you can do sober, which there are many of <laughs> sexually, especially if you have a variety of um, people. Um, you know, there's many different things that can be done. So presumably you could fix that with some degree of novelty sure yeah yeah <laughs> right um <laughs> it's a lesser studied um type of addiction <laughs> I, I brought it up you don't write about it at all but i thought oh, maybe you know something you know i've only begun to think about this where a lot of books written on opioid addiction a lot fewer written on meth addiction well i mean and, and like you know i'm deeply familiar with cocaine but not with meth like mm -hmm. because we're snobs and we don't do math unless we're gay. <laughs> 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 uh, like, hey, don't be a do. don't be a drug chauvinist now. Uh, no <laughs> drugs are better than any <laughs> others. <laughs> like it's really weird that in New York, like which is a big drug city, like you know, um, and this probably has changed since my day, but um, it, there was really no math. Yep. Yeah, I it's believe it. Community. No, no, it, it, it was probably 90s when it really started appearing everywhere. Right, yeah. right. But I don't think in New York, it's my impression at least, that it's still a cocaine town more than a meth town outside of the gay community. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I don't know that. What I can tell you is that in the festival community, cocaine is very common. We get people, I would say, 20% of what people bring to a dance safe booth at one of these large three day festivals is cocaine to get their cocaine tested. But right. nobody brings their meth to get it tested. And, hmm. and I think it, it, that it, meth is being used, uh, but there's just more stigma around meth. Again, except maybe in the gay community, the people who are using it are just not coming out right. and, and talking about it. So it's is it like straight men who think they'd be seen as gay if they showed their meth? No, I don't think it's that. I think it's uh, anyone. Uh, there's more of a stigma around meth because meth has got more of a stigma uh, around it. Cocaine still has an association of the glamorous 1970s, but the meth heads and the, the losing your teeth and all those imagery that we're pre presented with that, that does happen to a lot of people, right? Through the lack of sleep, the amphetamine psychosis, et cetera. It's not as an acceptable but we drug. we had all that stuff with crack. 
Like I guess if they they think it's powder cocaine, so they think it's okay. You still um, you don't you still don't see anyone out and proud smoking crack at festivals either. No, they no, might guess, be doing it, but there's these stigmas around, is what I'm saying. I think it's there. I mean, I think right. there's people using opioids. I think there's people on high dose daily opioids at festivals too, but they don't bring them to the booth to get tested. And I think the only reason is because the, there's a stigma around that. You don't you don't just go talking to your friends about yeah I shot up today etc. You you have your close friends that you'll admit that to, but you know cocaine, however, is very very acceptable these days. Well, see, what's interesting, I think, is like when you get to like either smoking or shooting meth or cocaine, that is not necessarily a social activity. Now, maybe you could have um, sexual activities around that, right? But it's usually not like you're usually getting quite isolated. Like it's not a party situation yes. when you're to the point of injecting or smoking these substances. Yeah, that's um, probably true. Snorting and, is a much more social activity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just like, you know, because the intensity of, um, you know, shooting these drugs and the, um, you know, the sheer paranoia that you get from stimulants <laughs> um, doesn't really necessarily lend itself to like a festival sort of situation, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah, well, I think that's on the come down or the lack of sleep. Um, you know, I don't really know where the paranoia comes from. It's probably a mixture of, of a lot of things. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I, I've always been kind of interested in, you know, what's the relationship between illegal drugs and paranoia, like, because obviously the like, cops are out to get you. Um, when things are legal, like, how does that affect the psychology of the paranoia around it, which we could study with marijuana now. Yeah, well, you know, so I am one who has to be real careful with cannabis. It's the only drug that can cause me to experience psychosis. I mean, it's paranoia with no object whatsoever. Like there's that funny uh, YouTube video or audio of the cop who eats the the marijuana brownies and then calls up 911 and he says, time's moving really slow. And he says, I think that I'm dead. He says, I'm <laughs> and, and my stepdaughter was laughing hysterically. She showed this to me years ago. And, and I said, you know, I've been there. I've thought that I was dead. And she was like, laugh. How could you think you were dead? And I'm like, well, if you think that when you die, you go to another place <laughs> and you're trapped in this eternity in this uh, psychotic state where, you know, then you could you could actually believe that you've died. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Uh -huh. The only the only time I ever had the I think I'm dead experience was when I sort of overdosed on a it was like dilated heroin and coke and I was doing speedballs of this weird <laughs> mixture um, but I ended up crying in the bathroom um, because I was dead and I was like really sad about being dead um, and eventually I passed out and I woke up thankfully um, but um, I think what that may be is when you are uh, the part of your brain that rep that sort of represents the self gets disconnected from the part of the brain that kind of represents the body. Oh my God, um, you are a super intellectual. You do realize that, right? <laughs> okay, is there a part of our brain that recognizes ourself separately from the part that recognizes our body? I mean, wouldn't then ketamine make us think that we were dead? Well, so, but sometimes, like, it's it's interesting because, like, there's these weird neurological syndromes, like, there's cop grass syndrome, for one, where people believe they have died, and they're dragging around this rotten hulk of a body, oh, and it yeah. does seem to, like, imaging-wise, be around that kind of a thing. Oh, interesting. And they, th but isn't that the one where you think that someone you know and love has been replaced by a replica? Okay, I maybe wait. I, there's two of them, and I may be mixing okay. them up. There's that one, and then there's the um, the right because there's one where you think everybody's been replaced by fakes. Yes, and that might be cop grass. But there's the other one is where you think um, uh, you are dead. I want to know and the name of this one. Um, I will have to think about that. <laughs> okay, you'll that have to I find it. You'll but, have to um, email that to me. That's but, what, yeah. <laughs> but there is there is such a syndrome, and it, it does seem to be a similar, like um, uh, V. S. Ramachandran writes about this, huh. um, and yeah, it's really um, now it's going to bother me that I can't remember that. But 
um, that part of my brain is disconnected at the moment. Well, so is there, <laughs> is there a name for a, a, a syndrome where you believe that you have died, but then instantly jumped into another trajectory in the infinite branching of multiverses? And so now you get another no, chance not, because... I have not heard of that one. But the point I was trying to I'm make. I'm sure I've died a dozen times given all the reckless drug taking activity I've okay. done and that I've just keep getting more chances. So. <laughs> but I think it's like I think it's very interesting. So cop grass where like you think everybody is fake, the theory of that is that your emotional regions that would um, sort of trigger the associations of love and affection that you would normally trigger when you see a familiar person they're not there. That's disconnected. And so you think they must be fake because it was if you were really seeing that right. person, you would have the warmth huh. and the emotional associations that you would um, normally have. And, and but what's interesting about these things is that they are syndromes. They are replicable things that reliably happen. Um, and so there must be some kind of uh, interesting physiology to them that has right. to do with way some of these drugs work well you should be able to uh do imaging studies to figure that out right we know the areas yeah. of the brain where we, we presumably i mean yeah. as much as we can but um but yeah no it's a very um uh it it really is an interesting area i think for sure well you know i think we'll end it with that um We've been talking an hour and 20 minutes, and unless you have something uh, to say, I was thinking this w would be about addiction. This episode would be about addiction. We've talked about a lot of different things, but generally we stayed there. So is there anything that you want to say that we haven't covered about addiction that you think is important? I mean, I think it's important for people to realize that there is hope and that most people do recover. And that even though addiction can be an absolutely horrifying experience, the thing for people who love people with addiction and people who have addiction, you can get better. It may take some time, and we have to really work on harm reduction to make sure that before you get there, you are staying alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, but that's... You know, if we can get people through these risks, if we can reduce the harm while they are not in a place where they are ready to change, then eventually they will usually be in a place where they can at least, you know, they talk about in harm reduction about any positive change where right. they can begin to build on those um, and get to a place where they feel comfortable in the world. Because the thing... I was afraid of when I was actively addicted was just that I would be stuck in an unbearably overwhelming and unfriendly and irritating, irritating world mm. if I had no substances. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I would always feel this pleasureless dread. And, you know, who wants to live like that? It's terrifying. Yeah. So yeah. that is not what my life is now. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're a successful writer, and you clearly are well uh, respected, and I'm sure loved, too, by many people around you. So, uh, you know, maybe if we um, elected Bernie, we could improve the economy <laughs> and eliminate uh, one of the main causes of addiction for so many people in our country, the poverty and despair that people are feeling. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, like, it is, it is important to realize that inequality has a great deal to do with addiction risk because as i was saying earlier the um the risk of addiction is highest like say in the one percent and in the um poorest um at the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, middle class genuine middle class life as boring as it may sometimes be <laughs> um gives you purpose and connection and meaning and avoidance of despair because you have those structures of community around you, sure. if you have a healthy middle class. Right, when 1% right. takes all the money and the middle class is constantly precarious, we then turn against each other and we're all left fighting for scraps. And that's when addiction risk gets really high because we traumatize each other. Mm -hmm. And we, the only real way to heal trauma is through connection and is through feeling loved and safe again right. and the more we distance ourselves from each other through inequality 
Um, and that happens as, you know, everybody just gets so separate and then you fight for the scraps. You know, the more um, the more that happens, the harder it is to get out of that cycle. Right. And so I think it's important to know that the connection between addiction and despair often runs through inequality and the countries that have reduced inequality and that have national health care and that have a better safety net, the richer people are happy too, are happier too. Because it's like when only 1% are going to do well, that means everybody else is going to be like fighting like a rat. And who wants to live in that world? Not me. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a wonderful place to leave it, Maya. Thank you so much. Let's hope that we do turn our country around. Uh, thank you for being on the show. You are a hero of mine, and this has been wonderful. Well, thank you, and I, I really admire your work as well. It's been really um, good talking to you over the next, over you know, the last day or so. Um, uh, you know, and and just trying to get a piece of harm reduction that um, I knew was out there, but that like I wasn't all that familiar with, kind of integrated into my thinking. Good, yeah. I didn't mention the audience, but Maya's writing a book on the history of harm reduction, and so she uh, interviewed me yesterday for her book, and then I interviewed her today, the next day for the podcast. So I, I look forward to your book. I, I can't can't wait. How long before it comes out? A year? Uh, um, it would. It's not going to be out um, this year. That's for sure. Twenty twenty one, basically. Twenty twenty one. Okay, great. I can't wait to read it. I'll have you back on the show. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Maya. Bye. Oh, take care. 